1955, after years of debate, the U.S. Congress settled on three alternative rail routes to the Pacific. The survey determined that the best southern route lay south of the border with Mexico in mostly vacant desert. This motivated the United States to complete the Gadsden Purchase. But like many things in Congress, the project stalled. Not until 1862, during the Civil War, President Abraham Lincoln finally signed the bill authorizing the building of the first railroad to the Pacific. Two companies contracted for the work were the Union Pacific, starting from Omaha, and the Central Pacific, starting from Sacramento. The Union Pacific was expected to do most of the tracks all the way to Reno whereas the Central Pacific had the most difficult portion crossing the Sierra Nevada. A good place to start this journey is the California State Railroad Museum in Sacramento. The museum has a collection of restored locomotives and railroad cars dating back to 1862. C.P. Huntington originally built in 1863, Santa Fe F7347C, built 1949 to 53, snowplow attachment, a large-scale mock-up of how the railroad was built through the High Sierra Nevada is on display. Chinese climbing Sierra Mountains, Theodore Judah, surveying Sierra Mountains. To understand how this was done requires one basic principle. Locomotives do not like to climb. A locomotive travels best on level ground. Less friction on its metal wheels, rolling on metal tracks gradient of just 1%, the track rise one foot over 100 feet, means a locomotive needs 25% more power to haul its load. Rail tracks must incline gradually to allow locomotives to ascend and to descend at a safe rate of speed. Most tracks on main lines have grades of 1% or less. Grades steeper than 2.2% are rare. So how can locomotives travel over the steep Sierra Mountains with an elevation as high as 7,056 feet? A prominent surveyor and railroad engineer, Theodore Judah, believed it could be done with the use of tunnels and raised ridge trestles. Judah surveyed five possible routes over the Sierras. Judah traveled to the east lobbying bankers and congressmen on the feasibility of a Pacific Railroad over the Sierra Nevada mountains. Fortunately, Judah found four local Sacramento merchants to help finance his newly incorporated Central Pacific Railroad Company in 1861. Each came to California and searched for gold and found success as dry goods shopkeepers. Each one had different skill sets that worked well as a team, politician, negotiator, builder, and accountant. The Sacramento merchants were later dubbed the Big Four of the Central Pacific Railroad. Within blocks of the California State Railroad Museum, is where the Central Pacific Railroad Depot still stands. Central Pacific Railroad breaks ground in Sacramento for the Transcontinental Railroad on January 8, 1863. The first rail, spiked, was delayed until October 26, 1863. All railroad equipment were manufactured on the East Coast. It had to take a two-month ocean voyage around the Cape Horn of South America before arriving 
in San Francisco, then transferred onto riverboats up to Sacramento. Dove Stanford number one first test run in Sacramento, November 10th, 1863. Stanford locomotive, it actually killed the first person on the railroad. They stopped on a city street, it used to run on an I street. Uh, as they jumped off, something, a piece of wood or something got in front of a wheel, the, the car jumped, it, it detracted and it severed the man's leg. And he laid in agony in the mechanics exchange across the street from what is today the museum for three days and he died. So when you see the Stanford and see that happy, glorious, beautiful engineer engine, just remember, it killed a guy. Just days before the Gov Stanford number one trial run, Theodore Judah died from yellow fever, contracted traveling through Panama on his many trips between East and West Coast. He was only 37 years old. Central Pacific's railroad was now firmly controlled by the Big Four. To finance this project, Central Pacific Railroad and Union Pacific raised capital through public bonds backed by the federal government. Federal officials would release the funds to the railroad builders after on-site federal inspectors verified the tracks were properly done about every 20 or 30 miles. The amount paid varied from $16,000 per mile of ground level tracks, about 436,000 in today's dollars, and to $48,000 per mile of track in the mountains, about 1,307,000 in today's dollars. who was a state journey during the 1860s. He was a pompous, arrogant, bad geologist, but he was the state geologist. And he was asked by the railroad to determine the actual base of the Sierra Nevada. And he decided that it's actually right about here. Arcade Creek that runs north-south right in this area. And he decided that the eastern side of Arcade Creek has a darker kind of sand on it than the western side. So this must be the base of the Sierra Nevada. And he wrote up an official report on his official stationery, and they sent it to President Lincoln, who signed his approval on that. And that gave the Central Pacific Railroad the ability to, to be paid $36,000 a mile from this point forward for 100 miles. President was at this ceremony, and afterward, he, he was said to remark, thus has Abraham's faith moved mountains. Central Pacific Railroad Help Wanted Ads wanted 5,000 laborers for constant and permanent work. Also experienced foreman. Apply to J.H. Strobridge, superintendent, on the work near Auburn. Nearly 2,000 white men signed up. Within a week after receiving their first pay, only 200 of them remain. James Strobridge was. Strobridge was who? He was, uh, the, yeah, the boss. he was the construction foreman, right, right. And if you if you see the TV show or if you actually see the few pictures of him, he's missing his left eye. He lost his eye here because they went and set a blast. The blast misfired. They went to check it, Strobridge and a Frenchman and someone else who was unnamed. And as they got to it, they did something that caused it to go. Shrapnel came out and took out Mr. Strobridge's eye. It killed the man next to him and seriously injured the French person. Strobridge was the only man on the railroad to bring his wife, Hannah, and his six adopted children. The Strobridges had a special car right behind the locomotive that followed them all the way to Promontory. I'll mention Hell on Wheels because I am very fond of it. It, it. it gave me my IMDB credit and I'm actually in the finale. But having said that, it is not historically accurate. 
It re really refers to the camps on the Union Pacific side. We're looking at the Central Pacific. There were no Hell on Wheels towns. But on the other side, Hell on Wheels referred to prefab buildings that could literally be folded up and put on a flat car, and every time they moved the end of track, they put them back up, and those were the Hell on Wheels towns. And very different than the Central Pacific. On, on the UP side, many Irishmen, many prostitutes, many gamblers, many places where they wanted you to be at the end of track in town and gamble and, and be with women of your fruit, lose your money, gunfights, killing, shootings, all sorts of things like this. On this side, it's a quite different culture. It's mostly Chinese, right? Chinese don't have that kind of history. They, they preferred opium, which is a much more peaceful thing than whiskey. I'm not going to argue which is better or worse for you. But also, past um, the town of Dutch Flat, there were no towns until they got to Cisco. And they built the town of Cisco. But past Cisco, there was nothing. And, 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 the, and nobody went back into town at the end of the day. They stayed in camp, so you didn't have the same sorts of experiences. This is the first place where Chinese were hired in groups to work on the railroad. And part of that was we need the labor. Part of it was the white guys were refusing to work on the railroad because it's really hard work. And the Comstock load in Nevada had hit, so a lot of uh, white people were going to make their fortunes in silver mining. And when they got there, they found out it was much worse than working on the railroad. Yeah. It was horrible work. Um, this at least had fresh air attached to it. There was also a huge Chinese population in Auburn. In 1862 in Auburn, about 10,000 people, 3,300 of which, exactly 33%, were Chinese. Yep. By far the largest single cultural ethnic group in the city of Auburn. The rest were Americans, most of that other 66%, and then less than 1% of English and Chilean and Mexican and everything else. So there's, there's Caucasians, and then there's Chinese, and then everyone else. So it was a huge part of the city. And in 1864, big labor troubles, lots of Chinese people, underemployed, not able to get a decent job. You could be a launderer, you could be a cook, you know, really not much else. And one of the reasons the Chinese were here, you probably heard this, is in Auburn, when they said, we run out of labor, we need to hire some Chinese, Stanford said, no, 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 they're little tiny people, they can't do this. And Crocker is thought to have said, you know, they built the Great Wall of China. They can do this. Suddenly, here comes good wages. So it still was discriminatory. They still were not paid the same as whites, but it was a step up from every, anything else as a Chinese worker. And oddly enough, there was a respect of the railroad to a certain extent, and there was also a scrupulous attention to detail when the railroad and the, and the six companies and the others, when they made promises to the workers, the promises were scrupulously kept. In January 1865, in the town of Auburn, the Central Pacific Railroad hired its first 50 Chinese as railroad workers. By the end of 1865, the Chinese workers had grown to 7,000, including those recruited directly from China. Only 2,000 whites remained on the payroll. It became apparent early in the season that the amount of labor likely to be required during the summer could only be supplied by the employment of the Chinese element of our population. Report of the Chief Engineer, 1865. The Chinese learned quickly, performed well as teams, and stayed healthy on the job. The only issue was it was impossible to tell Chinamen apart. The CP Railroad officials feared paying double wages to them. The Chinese were organized into groups of 12 to 20 men with a designated headman. The headman collected the wages for all those within his group. CP Railroad provided food for their workers, mostly boiled beef, beans, potatoes, and bread. The Chinese insisted on rice, fresh vegetable, fruits, dried fish, oysters, abalone, pork, and poultry. Chinese cooks were hired not only to prepare the food, but supplied the Chinese workers hot tea and boiled water throughout the workday. 
Their fellow white rail workers drank from unsafe stream water. CP railroad officials provided special rail cars, known as China Store, that brought the food the Chinese wanted, and on occasion included wine and opium. The supplies were paid for by the Chinese workers. At the end of their work shift, Chinese took hot tub baths and washed their clothes. On days off, Chinese may gamble and smoke opium, though not enough to affect their production the following work day. There are no definitive record on how many Chinese work for the Chinese Central Pacific Railroad. The numbers vary from 10,000 to 15,000 depending upon what was needed to be done at a given time. A large part of our force are Chinese, and they proved nearly equal to white men in the amount of labor they performed and far more reliable. No danger of strikes among them, E.B. Crocker, 1908. CP railroad officials were always proud to say the Chinese did as they were told. The Chinese did stage an unplanned strike, asking for the same wages and working conditions as their white counterparts. After negotiations failed, CP railroad officials cut off food supplies to the Chinese workers. Without support in the rugged, isolated Sierras, the strikers returned to work. And how many Chinese died during the building of the first transcontinental railroad? Expert opinions vary widely from 500 to 1,500 deaths. Many occurred during the harsh winter conditions in the Sierra Nevada mountains. Central Pacific Railroad did agree that any bones of the Chinese who died working will be returned to China. This was one promise that the CP Railroad tried faithfully to keep. I wanted to stop here because this was the reason the plaque has it misspelled saying it's the eighth wonder of the world. That's what the plaque says, but they misspelled it. It's one of the one of the wonders of the world because when they came to this point, it was relatively easy digging, and then they, then they stuck a shovel in the side of this mountain and went clonk. Here's why. This is what the this is what the the soil looks like here. This is not soil. <laughs> So this is considered concrete set, concreted sediment. And in way prehistoric times, there was a stream that flowed through here and then uh, um, uplift and changes in geology moved the stream and left these sediments behind. And, and for various chemical reasons, this is a very, very hard mountain. So, but here's where the line went for the railroad. So by golly, we've got to build it. Part of heavy use of black powder. And remember, this is 1864. So this is the height of the Civil War. And President Lincoln and the people at the War Department had to make decisions on fight off the Confederacy and how much it's important to build the railroad. But at one point during the height of construction of Bloomer Cut, and we'll go down and look in it, they were using up to 4,000 casks, and a cask is about this big, of black powder per day. An awful lot of black powder. And today, this really looks really much the same as it did in 1864. And somebody, as we were at the top, asked me, how can trains get through there? Look how narrow that is. Here's a famous photo from about 1870 after the railroad is completed, and it's, it's the view from here, basically, and these are Chinese woodcutters. Some of the Chinese, after the railroad was completed, stayed on working for contractors cutting cordwood in the Sierra Nevada. Look at, look at how the train sits in this narrow cut. If you were going to build a railroad today, it would be illegal to have a cut this narrow. The Federal Railroad Administration would require you to slope it back. But this is so stable that when you look at these historic photos, in some cases, you can still match cobbles on the wall today.
I don't know why it's called Cape Horn, except perhaps that roundness reminded people of the tip of South America. There was actually a platform built and passenger trains would stop so you could marvel at the view. It is a wonderful view into the North Fork American River. You can still go up there and you can still see the road that goes to Iowa Hill, which is on the same route it was at the time. It's paved now, but it's still scary when a, when a bus comes at you from the other direction. This is the place where I tell you that Chinese hung from baskets as they built the roadbed. Look at the slope. It's really closer to 45 degrees than vertical. And the vegetation in the 19th century was much the same as it is now. They did write in engineering journals that, yeah, this was tough, but it was nothing we haven't done before. And most of the histories talk about Chinese hanging on granite cliffs. This isn't granite. It's actually soft shale. And I've been up there, and you could actually dig it out with a shovel. You'd bend your shovel a couple times, but you could move it with a shovel. So I don't believe that the Chinese hanging here is part of the story, but it doesn't mean that it wasn't dangerous, it doesn't mean it wasn't heroic, it doesn't mean it wasn't a Herculean effort. It just means that they weren't hanging in baskets. This is where the trestle was for Secret Town. It's a wooden trestle, which means that it, it, it flexes when trains go across, and wood keep flexing will loosen bolts and nails and things. As it dries out, it becomes rickety. And a fill, once you create that, you never have to maintain it unless it erodes away. But it's much more stable and, and much more permanent. And they're whistling because they want you to back up. And then I want you to wave at my railroad museum docents who are in the observation car. Right there, they're right there. By the fall of 1865, the Chinese began the task of building 15 tunnels through granite rock at the highest elevation in the Sierra Nevada mountains. It's called a star bit, and until, I, until recently, I thought that star bits were the only kinds of rock drill used on the railroad. They also used spade bits, however. But the rock, drill is, the rock drill is what someone was asking me about. This was actually about six feet long in use, and a person would hold it and someone that they trusted very, very well would have a sledgehammer, and they would pound it, and the holder would turn a quarter turn, pound it, a quarter turn, pound it, a quarter turn, and ultimately the holes are between three and five feet deep for the most part, and that was sometimes more than an entire day to drill that one hole. Seven inches a day. Seven inches a day is, is the figure I'm hearing today, but it, of course it varies with people and, and the condition of the bit and things like that. This was how the tunnels were built. This is. This is really the thing about the Chinese workers is these hundreds and thousands of unknown men did this. So how were tunnels built in solid rock for railroads? Explosives, yes. Um, and in this case, both black powder and nitroglycerin. We, we should be able to tell the difference between the, the holes blasted with nitro and black powder. In black powder, the drills were two and a half inches in diameter. With nitroglycerin, it was an inch and a half. Why the difference? In a per volume measure, nitro is more powerful. So you can use less nitro, do the same amount of work, and by drilling smaller holes, you can drill more of them faster, so it speeds up the work. It's, it's really beneficial. Nitroglycerin was invented while the tunnel was being constructed, and they, and, but essentially nitro was illegal to ship anywhere because of its unstable nature, so they brought in a Scottish chemist, and he made it down in the call down here on site, carefully brought it up here, and they blew it up. And they stopped using nitro after Tunnel 8. Most people think that they had fears that it was so unstable they were worried about killing more people that they abandoned its use because they didn't have a patent license for it and the Nobel Company was going to come after them. The work was slow. It required drilling, blasting, scraping, shoveling, and hauling. In the tight quarters, only a handful of men could work at any one time. With men working round the clock between 6 and 12 inches per 24 hours was normal. Charles Crocker In the meantime, things were happening in Congress. CP Railroad's eastward expansion was originally limited to just 54 miles east of the California border. 
CP Railroad lobbied Congress to end the restriction. On July 3, 1866, President Johnson authorized CP Railroad to construct their road eastward until they connect with the Union Pacific Railroad. UP Railroad did not oppose the change. They believed they would be in Nevada before CP Railroad crossed the Sierra Nevadas with Chinaman laborers. It was now a race. The workforce swelled. It employed an estimated 8,000 on the tunnels and another 5,000 on the rail lines and related work. The Chinese were now pushed to work around the clock shifts. Sunlight was not needed inside the tunnels. On November 24, 1866, the first train arrives in Cisco, close to the summit tunnels. Supplies brought in by trains had to be loaded onto carts and wagons, then taken to the work sites. In spite of the harsh conditions the Chinese faced, they continued the to save time, living quarters were built next to the tunnel. I talked at Bloomer Cut that the sign says the eighth wonder of the world. For me, it's Summit Tunnel. It's crossing Sierra Nevada. It's those 12 tunnels between Truckee and Cisco that took over two years to build by hand. But the Chinese mostly worked you know, with other Chinese. It was very insular, strong friendships, strong familiar relationships. And, and working in an extreme, for very low pay, under terrible conditions. People here, so I wanted to start here. This, of course, is the center shaft of the Summit Tunnel. The tunnel runs right through here. And, but I wanted to start here because there's pieces of original rail here. But this stuff is so badly weathered and degraded and just rotten that even the looters won't steal it because it doesn't have any value for that. So don't steal it! <laughs> but this was here because when the shaft was in use, not just when it was built, but after it was built, the railroad kept it open because steam engines need oxygen and they need to exhaust their stuff out. So this was also an exhaust. They had a grate made of rail on top of it. When they closed the tunnel, I believe this happened, I don't know the exact date, but when they closed the tunnel in 1993, or, or they detracted it rather, they put the iron cover over it. So they cast this stuff aside. So this is part of the original Central Pacific Rail. In, in the building of the Central Pacific Railroad, eastward from Sacramento to Promontory, power equipment wasn't used because the railroad couldn't afford it. It was all manufactured in the east. It would have to be shipped around the tip of, of Cape Horn in South America um, and brought back up. So they didn't use power equipment, with one exception right here. And the very first locomotive ever brought to California was, oddly enough, named the California Locomotive. It was part of the the first, local, the first railroad that Theodore Judah built that went from Sacramento to Folsom and the Central Pacific purchased that railroad. They disassembled that locomotive and they stripped it of its boiler and they brought the boiler up here, right here in a vertical position, and they built a hoist using it so they could lift the rock out of this. Why did they need a center shaft? Air, Air taken too long is the real answer. This is very hard rock, so they're entering from the east and west portals, and they're making six to nine inches per day. Yikes! 1,654 feet at 18 inches a day. That's going to take forever. What if we drill a center shaft and go down to where the tunnel is and then start working our way out? Then we have four faces to work on instead of two. We double our progress. This is brilliant. And actually, how do you place this? It's actually a really simple survey problem. You go to the opening of the tunnel, you mark your angle, you project up, you put a stake, you go there, you project, you put a stake, and so forth, and you know that this is right on the line of the tunnel, even though it doesn't exist yet. And when the tunnel, in fact, was complete, it was off in alignment by about half an inch. Wow! Unacceptable. Wow. <laughs> Unacceptable for Toyota, perhaps, <laughs> but good enough for me. And you're in a hole that's really about this wide. It's my, my, reach is, my reach is over six feet. It's actually about eight feet wide. So there's two men down there doing the same thing, and this time you're going this way and this way. Holy cow. My God, this is what got me so interested, I think, ultimately, in how important this history is. I can't imagine anybody doing this.
Yet here's people that came from 5,000 miles away that don't speak the language, that may not quite understand what the heck they're doing, except it feeds their family back home. And they do this thing. So eighth wonder of the world down there? I think not. I think right here. The locomotive, by the way, went back, and it went back into service. There's also a road that comes up here that, that serviced this place off of the Dutch Flat Road over there, and we can find pieces of telegraph line and stuff right here. When trains ran through it, they had to especially train crews to break the ice out of the tunnels every morning, and then it would go down in between the rails and fill in between the rails, and then they would have to take a chainsaw and cut notches in all the ice and then lay detonating cord and blow it up and then push it out. Very high maintenance but it really is a remarkable achievement. And when they first, you know, knocked that hole and air started coming through, the tunnel is always windy, I can't imagine what kind of cheers they would have had because they finally knew it was possible. Really well-known railroad experts said you could never possibly do this, and for many years, this was the longest and highest railroad tunnel in the world. It isn't anymore, but it really is a magnificent thing. Through in October, 1866 and the first trains ran through the following summer because hold through means there's a little hole then you got to make it big then you have to flatten it and lay ballast and lay rails and ties and connect everything up they've done this and they've been doing this since about Colfax you learn that the grain and the pattern of the rock helps decide where it's going to cleave at and they and they worked with the rock to do that as any master mason would do this is not unskilled work at this point it's very very skilled so they blast it up, the waste rock comes out, and much of the waste rock is in China Wall. The, the wall and the fill under the roadbed is the waste rock from the tunnel. And if you're an engineer, by the way, building a road, you, one, of the way, one of the things you consider when you design your road is to make your cuts volume equal your fill needs so that you have as little waste as possible. That played out in here mightily. Um, there is some rock thrown over the side, but particularly in China Wall, it's very good use of, of what the inside of the tunnels is. You're touching the same rock surface that your predecessors did 153, 154 years ago. It, you know, atoms have worn off, of course, but until 1993, every westbound train, and until about 1918, every eastbound train also traveled through this tunnel. That means that not only Common people such as my parents and my mom and people like that did that. But kings and presidents and people headed to war and people escaping bad environments and people escaping debts and people looking for their fortunes and all sorts of things came through here. And they passed by this, which as the Chinese finished this tunnel, they didn't have a ceremony to go, hey, we're done. They're going, hey, we're in a race. We've got to keep going, you people. And so they just abandoned this work and left this evidence behind for us to find today. In August 1867, Summit Tunnel Number 6 broke when sunlight from the other end of the tunnel could be seen. It would take another three months to widen the tunnel, grading, and laying tracks. November 30, 1867, the first scheduled train passed through the summit. Okay, we've got most everybody, and I only heard one wow as people saw the wall. Okay, thank you. Much more, not me, the wall. The wall. And I, I want to stay out of the way here because I don't want to ruin your pictures. But like I was explaining back there in Tunnel 7, this was built in great haste at peril of life and limb. I have seen one photo showing it under construction, and in the photo taken from over there, at the edge of the wall here, there is a derrick, and the derrick was used to lift these stones, which are over 300 pounds in some cases, and carefully place them in, into place. This wall is famous in that it is called a dry-laid wall, which means there's no mortar that holds it together. It is interlocked like a jigsaw puzzle, and every so often there's a very long stone that goes all the way back in that helps anchor it in the fill that is behind it. It is slanted back at 70 degrees, and that's important for its stability. The wall has been here since 1866 or 67. Until 1993, it carried westbound trains. It carried hundreds of thousands of trains carrying everything known to man and people and hopes and wishes and sorrow and money and poverty and everything. It lasted 
through the Spanish-American War in World War I and World War II, and it was so vital in World War II, it was patrolled by the Army to protect it. The telegraph line, of which we've seen a few remnants of as we've come through here, carried news of Lincoln's death. It carried news of elections and of the Spanish-American War and the armistice on November 11, 1918, that ended World War I, and news of people's births and deaths and tragedies and everything else through here, all connected with the railroad. And there's this wall that there was no road down here. Nobody was ever going to see this, but look at how beautiful. Look at the colors and the patterns. And somebody asked me, did they have masons build this? Oh, yes, they did, but the masons were the same people who made the tunnels. They were the Chinese. And see the two large stones right in the middle that are sort of offset by each other? Look at the top one on the bottom right side of it, and you'll see feather and wedge marks. That's how these stones were made. It was blown out of the tunnels, carried over to a quarry site. They were made into smaller pieces. And in some cases, like right here, they didn't make the cut and they were cast aside. There's another one right there and probably a pile of other ones there. And uh, because look at this wonderful wall that they built. And uh, I just wanted to drop some, some rice. And remember those people, those brave, courageous, um, Chinese railroad workers, but they uh, like broke their backs uh, lifting all those uh, rocks. How did they do that? If they lit the dynamite and the people didn't pull the basket back up fast enough, they're gone. Their families in China didn't know what happened to them. So this is in remembrance of all those brave railroad workers. See the the spirit or the, uh, the soul of our ancestors uh, who paved the way for us and uh, helped us to have the, the good life that we have now. There was no breaks during the cold winters. With the task of the tunnels nearly done, CP Railroad and the Chinese rail workers faced them. During the winter of 1867-68, 40 storms brought a total accumulation of 40 feet of snow. The power of snow is enormous. Few things are more powerful than snow. The snow became an issue in getting the project done and when completed, keeping the trains running. Lives were lost due to snow. One report stated as many as 100 Chinese died in a single avalanche. Some bodies were not recovered until the following spring defrost. All sorts of ideas were tried, including the snow plow attached to the front of the locomotive. It was Leyland Stanford who came up with the idea of having wooden sheds cover the tracks to protect against snow, something that had never been done before. The snow sheds worked. Eventually, 37 miles were built. Later, the wooden sheds were replaced with ones made of fire-resistant concrete. The first locomotive through the snow shed. On May 1st, 1868, the first train arrives in Truckee, the staging area for work going down to Reno. Tracks were already being laid to Reno within days after Summit Tunnel No. 6 had been opened. The first passenger train arrives in Reno crossing the Sierra Nevadas June 18, 1868. The rails arriving to Reno vindicated Judah's belief in the Sierra Nevada Railroad. The route Central Pacific followed was essentially the one Judah laid out. It took CP Railroad five years to build the 140 miles of track between Sacramento and Reno. 
CP Railroad reached Promontory Point 570 miles from Reno in less than a year. As the two railroads got closer, President U.S. Grant was worried that they would run parallel to one another, receiving excessive federal subsidy. He had Congress declare on April 9, 1869, the common terminus of the two railroads shall be at Ogden. The two railroads were allowed to meet at Promontory Point to connect and form one continuous line. CP Railroad agreed to pay UP Railroad $4 million for the line from Promontory to Ogden. With job near the end, Central Pacific Charles Crocker bet $10,000 with Thomas C. Durant of Union Pacific that his CP rail crew could lay 10 miles of track in a single day. The newspaper headline, With the Eight Sons of Iron and the Sons of John Chinaman, a Victory. The account only listed the names of the eight Irishmen. To this day, no one really knows how many Chinamen participated in the event. This marked the high point for many railroad workers. Within a week, large numbers of workers were discharged. A few were sent to the rear to fix hastily laid sections. Chinese workers laying the last rail connecting the Central Pacific and Union Pacific Railroads. The most iconic photo of the event by Andrew J. Russell. The first transcontinental railroad opened and stimulated the growth of the West and linked an industrial economy on a national scale. In 1870, traveling from New York to San Francisco by ship and train via Panama, one month, 5,000 miles. By ship around Cape Horn, two months, 13,000 miles. By wagon train overland, five months, 3,000 miles. By express train, it would take only five days, 2,600 miles. Though it would cost first class with sleeping car $136, second class seating $110, Immigrant class on bench, $65. In 1904, most trains bypassed Promontory Point using a causeway that traveled over the Great Salt Lake. Going across the lake saved 44 miles off the route. The Big Four merged Central Pacific and Southern Pacific Railroads to control most rail traffic in the West. The Big Four became fabulously wealthy. Chinese rail workers did not fare as well as the Big Four. The Chinese were needed to build rail lines throughout the United States, Canada, and Cuba. This allowed the Chinese to travel across the country before most rail work ended in the 1880s. Work was found wherever they went. The Chinese settled down in small towns and large cities throughout the Western United States. The railroads did bring new immigrants to settle out west. The population in California alone in 1870 was 560,247, but by 1890 it was 1,213,398, doubled in growth. As more immigrants poured into the West, the Chinese were driven out. Chinatowns were burnt to the ground to make way for the new white arrivals. In 1882, 
Chinese laborers were no longer allowed to migrate into the United States. Chinese were the first immigrants denied entry into the U.S. Chinese already in the U.S. could stay but not become naturalized citizens. The new laws only increased violence against all Chinese in the U.S., legally allowed or not. By the 1890s, the few Chinese employed by the railroads were in isolated, low-pay, track maintenance jobs. Unseen by the public. Golden Spikes 50th Anniversary Celebration Float, May 10, 1919, Ogden, Utah. Jin Kui, Wan Fuk, Lei Xiao, three of the eight Chinese men who brought up the last rail 50 years earlier, stands on the float. The Chinese contribution to U.S. railroads faded out of America's consciousness. The seldom used rails through Promontory Point were removed for use in the war efforts of World War II. Promontory Point becomes the Golden Spike National Historic Park in 1957. The park's highlight is the reenactment of the historic event without the Chinese present. At the 100th anniversary of the first transcontinental railroad celebration, a plaque honoring Chinese rail workers was unveiled, with some controversy. Philip Choi, president of the Chinese Historical Society of America, CHSA, was promised a spot on worldwide television to present the plaque honoring Chinese rail workers. Last minute, his time was cut from the program, replaced by John Volt, then U.S. Secretary of Transportation. John Volt's remarks included, Who else but Americans could drill tunnels in mountains 30 feet deep in snow? Who else but Americans could chisel through miles of solid granite? Who else but Americans could have laid 10 miles of track in 12 hours? The work was done by Chinese who were banned from becoming American citizens. In 2019, on the 150th year celebration, the Chinese rail workers' story was told. In Ironically, the U.S. Secretary of Transportation Elaine Chow is of Chinese descent. Revival of America's Consciousness. You look at some of the things he did or they participated in, they're heinous. And you know, the most the most famous, of course, is when he ran for governor, his entire platform was anti-Chinese. Thank you. When you see a book that co will come out next May from Gordon Chang, yes. that's the popular history, you'll find out that Stanford had personal house servants, trusted Chinese people that he was very fond of. And you, you've also probably seen the hill painting, the last spike, if not, you'll see it tomorrow in the museum. Prominently, right in front are Chinese yeah. that Stanford had placed there. Mm -hmm. They are clearly subordinate to him because he's the white guy. But he, he felt strongly enough that he had them put in the prominently in the painting. And that was his choice. That was not the artist's choice.